So I want to thank everyone for joining us today at our workshop. And um, this is going to be the Nazis look to United States race laws, racial regimes in the 1930s. During this particular workshop, um, we are going to be talking about the curriculum based on the Fortunoff Ar video archive for Holocaust testimonies, focusing on race and citizenship in Nazi Germany and Jim Crow US. <clears throat> Excuse me. These lessons include working with testimony, engaging with thought provoking questions and secondary sources. If throughout the workshop you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And then after the presentation, we will um, have this five hours on the Belarus border. A Ukrainian official says the two sides. All right. And if everyone can just make sure they are muted and we will go forward. I would like to introduce our speakers today. So our first speaker is going to be Aya Marchek, who is the Associate Research Scholar at the Macmillan Center and Curriculum Development Fellow at the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale. She is leading Fortunoff Archive's new effort to provide testimony-centered curriculum and professional learning to middle school and high school teachers. Prior to coming to Yale, Aya was a Templeton Fellow and Director of Education at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia where she worked with teachers in diverse school districts to bring historian debates into high school classrooms. She's also co-edited and translated several books that explore the intersection of culture and politics, including Against Anti-Semitism, an anthology of 20th century Polish writings. She also has a PhD in European intellectual history from the University of Pennsylvania and an MS in cognitive psychology from Bucknell University. She's a graduate of Stratford High School and is grateful to work with Connecticut teachers. And one of our Connecticut teachers is Colleen Simon, who is going to be also presenting. <coughs> Excuse me. She is a middle school humanities teacher at the Solomon Schechter Day School in West Hartford. Colleen is a member of the Board of Directors of Voices of Hope, which was founded by the families of Holocaust survivors in Connecticut. She is also on the Education Committee of the Susan Mendez Foundation and the Center for Genocide Research and Education, located in Longmont, Colorado. Colleen received training at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as a teacher fellow, class of 2016. She was accepted into their conference for Holocaust Education Centers program in 2019. She is a PhD candidate in the Holocaust and Genocide programs at Gratz College. Her research focuses on the role of choice and acts of rescues during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. She hopes to complete her dissertation by May 2020. I am going to let Maya take over. All right, thank you so much, Sarah, for the introductions. And thank you everyone for, uh, for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, it's been a very challenging week in all kinds of ways with the invasion of Ukraine. And I just wanna acknowledge that that's happening in our world and express my solidarity with Ukraine. Um, and today really uh, what I'd like to do is just frame a little bit about uh, the Fortune of Archive for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, what the spirit of the archive and, and then this new effort to create a curriculum. And then uh, to share a little bit about this curriculum unit that Sarah mentioned uh, that, and Colleen will be talking about more extensively. Um, so let me start by screen sharing uh, just to show a little bit about the archive. So is that coming through clearly? Okay. So the Fortune of Archive currently is housed at Yale University and it's been there for a few decades now, but it started in 1979 as an, a grassroots effort of survivors in the New Haven area to record their stories. They came together. So it was this effort by survivors and for survivors to, to really tell their stories. Um, and so that really has shaped how the archive evolved and, and the spirit of, of its approaches and, and methods. So the archive um, has many affiliates around the world and has collected testimonies from a variety of individuals with firsthand experience of Nazi crimes. And so they included Jews and non-Jews, uh, Sinti and Roma, survivors, uh, those who were in hiding, bystanders, members of the resistance, uh, liberators, and post-war aid workers. So you can see just in that brief uh, kind of overview, a number of very different perspectives. Um, testimonies were recorded in whatever language the witness preferred, and currently there are over 4,400 testimonies in 19 uh, different languages. 
Um, so as you know, archives around the world hold tens of thousands of testimonies from Holocaust survivors. And the Fortune of Archive was one of the first to do this kind of work with video and is the longest arc active project that is still uh, doing this kind of recording. Um, I should mention, you know, I'll be focusing on, and Colleen will be talking about our curriculum, in addition to the curriculum where at this moment in time when survivors are passing away and digital media are allowing for new ways of sharing the collection. So we're trying to share it in, in different ways that honor the survivors and their stories. We have podcasts uh, with stories from testimonies. We have music, beautiful story uh, melodies rec reconstructed from uh, the survivors singing them. So I invite everyone to take a look around the website um, and listen. But then moving on to um, the this curriculum effort, um, the principle or the idea that's at the very heart of this is looking back at this methodology that was created at the Fortune of Video Archive that has resulted in this, this really rich collection. Um, and this methodology, because it came from survivors themselves, really stresses the leadership role of the witness. Witnesses are the experts in their own life story and they decide how to tell it and how to structure it so that interviewers don't come in with long lists of prepared questions, but rather study each survivor's or witness's background first, and then come to listen, to learn, and to, to ask clarifying questions. So we place emphasis on open-ended questions that allow the witnesses in the uh, ways that, in, to answer in ways that they feel is best. Uh, and this has contributed to this incredibly rich variety of ways of moving through the 20th century uh, by listening to, to these stories. And with that spirit of really honoring these individual stories of suspending our own agenda, you know, as interviewers, uh, as listen, listeners, we then try to ask ourselves, what would it mean to create curriculum around this? What would that look like? And what, where is the emphasis? Um, and so that, centering of the voice of the survivor of the witness is, is first. And then there is this need for very deep and careful historical study. So everything that we do in the curriculum is anchored in disciplinary historical thinking, in putting testimonies in dialogue with each other, with primary sources, with historical scholarship, um, and allowing students to enter that space of historical um, investigation. And um, what I'd like to just to, I, I don't know, Sarah, what, did you have a chance to share the link to the uh, collection ahead of time? I did. And I also want to let you know that for some reason, we're seeing a gray strip on, on your screen. So I don't know if there's anything. Yep. How is that? Is that yep. better? better? Okay. Sorry about that. I think it's just the zoom over that. Okay. So I, I won't send the link right now, but this is just the landing page of the curriculum. We will get the link out to everybody if you'd like to, to take a look at any point. But this is a draft of this curriculum. We decided to tackle, again, a very difficult question, not just historical thinking, but historical comparisons and the question of how would testimony support that um, to really kind of make explicit the different elements that go into making comparisons. So you'll see this curriculum starts with, it's, it consists of about 14 lessons. It's meant to be very flexible for teachers to, to choose what fits their context, their courses, and Colleen will say a lot more about that. But the way we've organized it is there are two introductory lessons uh, that talk about the method and the approach. Then there are a few lessons on Nazi Germany and the Nuremberg laws in particular, the Nazi dictatorship. Then we shift to the work of uh, James Whitman um, and his book, uh, Hitler's American Model, where he found not only parallels between Nazi laws and uh, race laws and Jim Crow race laws, but also the possibility that the Jim Crow race laws, in fact, may have influenced the writing of the Nuremberg laws. And we invite students to think about, you know, look at his passages and how he argues that case and how carefully he argues that case. Um, and then we shift to the American context and we look at some of the specifics of Leon Bass's experience in, in the South and some of the race laws. Um, so this is the thematic outline. We have uh, the center of the curriculum are three stories by three witnesses. The first is Leon Bass, an African-American soldier and later a teacher and a, a principal in Philadelphia history teacher, no less. And he arrived in Buchenwald in 1945 with the segregated US Army. Um, 
And then that really changed his life and his uh, drew him to teaching and, and this mission of, of speaking out against racism in all its forms, as he said. Um, and then we have Martin Schiller's story. Martin Schiller was a Polish Jew who was imprisoned in a couple of different camps, but was in Buchenwald in 1945, uh, still a child. He was 11 or 12 at the time. And then we bring in the story of John Weil, who was a uh, Jewish um, teenager in Nazi Germany. He turned 13 in 1933. Um, just as Hitler came to power, he had his bar mitzvah, and he provides this really powerful, unique vantage point of a teenager coming into political awareness throughout the 30s. He then emigrated to the United States. So their stories help to, to bring students into the space. And then there's all kinds of different sources to, to build out the full context. And let me just do one last thing, which is to look at one of the lessons a little more closely, just for structure, um, and then turn it over to Colleen. And let's, um, so the lessons essentially, this one is, is a setup lesson. This is lesson number two. So it still talks about the method, thinking about historical inquiry and comparisons. So it starts with listening to testimony and listening to a passage from Dr. Bass. And I want us to listen to that together. One, um, one quick mention before that is that the other lessons, most of them start with a central historical question that is sort of the point of the, the center of investigation throughout the lesson. This one is a little different that way. But let's listen to this uh, one excerpt from Dr. Bass's testimony um, where he talks about his experience after returning to the United States after the war, uh, because that moment in his testimony is really the starting point uh, for this unit. So I want to play this for you, but I need to do it from my desktop for streaming reasons to uh, have it, the sound come through well. So I'll stop the share and uh, get the video and let me know if you can, everyone can see that. Okay. And let's see if the... And uh, I discovered, though, that the same pain that I left when I left here, the same... What happened? My apologies, I don't know what just happened. Hang on just one moment. I'll pull this up again. And try again. And uh, I discovered though, that the same pain that I left when I left here, the same pain that my father experienced when he came back here was waiting for me. I came back to this country and I went to school and I was walking down High Street with some of my white friends and we went to a drugstore and we went in and they ordered coffee and I ordered a glass of milk. There must have been about eight cups of coffee, you know, but no milk. And the lady filled the coffee, put the sugar and cream in, and kept looking for the manager until finally she got his attention and beckoned to him. He came over, she whispered to him. And then he called over one of my white friends and whispered to him. And while doing this, looked right at me. And I knew my antenna was up. I had been conditioned. I knew that something was not kosher. And so I waited until finally the fellow came over and he looked at the coffee. He said, let's go, fellas, come on. And he ushered all of us out. And of course, there was some kind of misunderstanding. The fellow said, wait a minute, wait a minute, the coffee is there. He said, no, no, we don't want any. He said, why? He said, they didn't want to serve Leon. Can you imagine? I put in three years of my life, put it on the line to make it possible for people like that young lady, that manager, or whoever owned that store, to function and enjoy the rights and privileges of the Americans. And they were saying to me, just like the Nazis did, just like they told me down in the South, what they told my father, Leon, you're not good enough. What a damnable kind of thing to say to somebody. And here I am now, 21, and back from the wars, and still can't get that relief that I needed. So that's, uh, that's Dr. Leon Bass. His testimony is, is just very powerful. I will, um, I, this, this moment in the testimony where he draws this experiential connection between the two contexts is a starting point. So one, 
for, for centering his voice and, and listening, what does he mean by this, right? What, what, this, what is this comparison? And then the curriculum really builds out around it a whole a historical investigation with various sources. So I'm just going to go uh, back to the screen share for one moment to, uh, to that lesson, just to share with you what the, the structure of the lesson. So after the testimony, so testament, the students would listen to the testimony. Then they are encouraged to think about some very open-ended questions to try to think about what is happening in that context, but to also ask their own questions. Um, and then after that moment to stop and to listen and to think of their questions, uh, we try to provide in every lesson some form of historical context so that students who may or may not have a lot of background knowledge about those particular realities can get a little bit more grounded in it. Uh, then we include different types of sources. In this lesson, there is a secondary source included. This is a text that the Fortune of interviewers read to learn about how to conduct interviews. Uh, and the text is, is fascinating from an oral history of a sharecropper in Alabama, Ned Cobb. Many of you have probably know about it, but it's a fascinating uh, story if you, if you haven't come across it. And then in this particular lesson, we do a little bit more thinking about historical comparisons with students and the concluding activity is for them to start articulating their initial hypotheses about this comparison. And we name it explicitly as hypotheses as their ideas that they bring to the table that are the, the start then together with Dr. Bass's um, experiences. They are the beginning of this broader investigation. And our hope in creating the curriculum was to make that investigation as flexible and adaptable to teachers' different circumstances and needs. Um, and so with that, I just want to give a quick shout out to Stu Abrams for supporting us in that effort and helping with advice along the way, and also to Colleen for her great work on it. And I will turn it over to you, Colleen, to take it from there. So thank you. Thank you, Aya, for um, presenting the framework and also for your remarks on Ukraine. Um, so I am going to kind of walk you through how it, this looked in my classroom. But before we start, I just need to give you a spoiler alert. I am in my classroom and school will end at 325. You'll hear a bell. And then at 330, you'll hear announcements of the bus and where people need to go. And um, so I, I'm just kind of letting you know that you're going to hear some of that. So I'm apologizing um, in advance. So um, Ooh. All right. So, oh, this all works very well. So, um, so I want to acknowledge that today is the last day of um, Black History Month, and the man considered the father of Black history, Carter G. Woodson, famously wrote in 1933, "If you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions." And um, I included this because I know that there are a lot of teachers kind of under threat or um, that are dealing with, you know, how to teach. And what I love about this curriculum is that it is all based in historical fact. And, and we'll see that as, as we go through and, um, you know, we're teaching history and teaching students to be historians and um, also to acknowledge that I teach in a very small Jewish day school, so I have um, a different kind of freedom I um, I don't have to always, you know, I don't have a board of education, we don't have a board of education that we have to answer to. So there's a little bit more independence, so I understand that as I present and I know not everybody might have some of those. Um, freedoms that I have when I present my um, curriculum to my students. And just real quickly, um, Dr. Mark Brackett, he does a lot with emotion and we've all gone through this Zoom fatigue. And, and you know, today was the first day I actually saw some of my students' faces. Um, not everybody has taken off their masks, but so there's been a lot. So I always start my lessons with this mood meter and they talk about it. So it's just really to set the tone because I don't do it all the time, but there are times that we're dealing with some really tough um, histories and just to let the students be aware of how they're feeling. So this just is a tool to give them more vocabulary. So they, they don't know to say I'm happy, I'm sad, but there's a vocabulary and it's a, it's a, a spectrum of, of how you how you feel. So we use that in the classroom. 
And then also just as a reminder, I know you're all, you know, well-known educators. So, but just, you know, when you're having difficult conversations and you build that community in your room, and this is just like a real quick crib note to be open, listen actively, respond respectively, pass the mic to share the space, um, stories stay, lessons leave, and then to press pause. Sometimes we just have to take a breath. I do that a lot. We'll take a breath because things, if they get heated or some of this um, gets sad, and we'll see how that's also shown in the um, in the lessons and how that, that works. So as I have said, you know, there are 13 um, units in, in this curriculum, and you can do it in, in a lot of different ways. That's what I love about it. And as, as teachers, you know, we know our students, we know what's going to work. And I actually, I'm in a Jewish day school, but I don't teach a, um, a Holocaust unit or I don't teach about the Holocaust, but I teach American history. So, and I know, you know, if you look, it says this is really, it's developed for high school students, but it's also modified for middle school. So I teach eighth grade and I use this with my eighth grade and the way that um, our U.S. history curriculum is built, it's those who are already here, those who chose to come, those who were forced to come. And so I put this in my unit on, so that's those who were forced to come is on enslavement. And so I put this in my unit on um, that period of American history. You know, we start with the Middle Passage and then and going up through Reconstruction. Um, and also, so I don't have to use, you know, I, I and also since we are in a Jewish day school, they have a separate lesson on Holocaust. So they have a lot of the background already. Um, so I didn't, I don't need to follow those lessons. So, but I did absolutely started with lesson one um, because that really puts the students in the place of how to listen to Holocaust testimony and, and what to get out of there. And also lesson two, the lesson that Aya um, showed you is um, looking at historical inquiry and and because comparisons gets a little tricky and so it gets them grounded in that. And then also, if you notice, I don't go chronologically. I start with like, once I get into the lessons, I started with lesson nine and then lesson eight and then lesson um, 11. And so again, that gives, you know, because for my students that worked the best and you're gonna, you know, as I said, and Sarah said, you'll be given the link to this curriculum. Um, but for now, we're just gonna stay together as I go through this, how it looks in my classroom. So I apologize in advance if um, if some of you aren't familiar with it, if I'm going too quickly, um, you know, you can just put something in the chat to, to talk about because I, I I know what this looks like and I might tend to talk um, without really giving the, um, oops, 325, without giving the, um, the background. So this is the um, um, screenshot from lesson one. And what lesson one does is it really puts them in to, to, into the space of being an historian. And I love how they use the word like us because it's teaching the students to be historians. When I first did writers workshop, the whole thing was, you know, I call my students writers because that's what they are. And and in, in when I'm teaching history, I call them historians. And because that's, you know, we want to deepen our understanding of the past and trying to, to show them that they're not just students, they're actually working. And so there's three main questions just to get them thinking. And um, so what can they use to deepen our understanding of the past? And if, you know, if you look the ones that are in, in black, those are the basic um, documents that they stated, you know, when we were just doing our brainstorming. And then as we went on, then they started realizing, oh, we need context to build this. And how are we going to get the context? And so we talked about secondary sources, and then they added diaries. So I'm just really, so this, the next two questions are on a, on a different slide. It's the same question, but what it does is it really um, puts the students in the moment. And so we talked about how does trauma, emotion, and violence of the past influence how we analyze historical sources and and you can um just read what the students said but a lot of it is bringing in the humanity of the people that we're learning about and this is also one of you know with the holocaust museum you know how they want us to teach that it's about individuals and you know turn statistics into people and um it it, it just really brings in that humanity and so you know you can see the students are really impressed by that because it's 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 hearing the story um 
it helps us get through and it gets it helps with their empathy and so we're not insensitive and this isn't just written in some kind of place that we can't um, understand and then they also look at the role of first person observation because that's you know like Aya said this all starts with um, testimony so and again with the students talked about telling the story from that perspective we do a lot talking about perspective and this it just naturally comes up and um, you know, history is complicated. And so, yes, we're going to have facts, but we're also going to have uh, opinions, experiences. And again, that humanity comes up again and um, making it real. So that, you know, so this is where they're starting from. And it, again, that grounded in, in seeing this as, as the people. And, um, and, I, and that's important because it really, they start looking at it in a very different different way. So this um, slide, so we set the stage, as I said, so that sets the stage, we're ready to go into this and we're ready to dive into the specific learning. And like I said, the, the lessons, they do a lot of background on Nuremberg laws and, and what's going on in Germany. And, but my students already have that context, so we can go right to lesson nine. And what this is, this is where it gets the tricky because this is when we start looking at that idea of comparison. And unfortunately, our students hear that a lot in the news and we've been hearing that a lot and, and what does that look like and, and trying to teach them to do so. We go back to that testimony of Leon Bass that, that you all heard, which is, um, you know, he really sets the stage. And we also are gonna look at the testimony of of John, a, a survivor who lived in Germany under the Nuremberg Law. So we have Leon Bass, please attention, please. who lived, All students sorry, going home, that's going the to notice. Please report to the Remo Neem classroom. All students going home by car, please go to the back sorry. doors. And all students going home by bus, please head to the front. Have a great afternoon. Okay, thank you. So, um, and so looking at living in in the united states under jim crow and, and living under the nuremberg laws and and this is just a, a shot but that word incom, incom, ugh, incomparable because we don't want to compare um experiences but we can look at the laws that existed in these two parts of the world um the laws that harm these two individuals but again that's a guideline from the ushmm we don't want to do comparisons of pain but this, this lesson begins to ask students also, if you can see um, how this idea of race comes about and how it's even um, constructed in their countries and how this idea of race excludes people and it dimin diminishes their rights and it diminishes their citizenship. So we start seeing that. And then when we listen to the testimony and learn about the historical context, the students were, are then asked to you know the central question that I mentioned each lesson except for lesson two starts with it with a central question and the question was what type of racial discrimination did black Americans face at the start of the 20th century and then also based on John W's testimony we also discussed what types of racial discrimination did Jews in Germany face starting in 1933. so I just want to share with you um, this was the chart you know we were talking about the different discrimination but what was really interesting, and again, it's, it's, and I'm sure other teachers, when something you're doing in class kind of expands to the real world or outside of your classroom, it's always um, this amazing unit or amazing moment, especially when the students notice it. So the day that we had this discussion and, and one of the students, and um, again, remember I, work, I teach in a Jewish day school, so one of the students just asked, you know, we were charting the questions and was Judaism considered um a race and that was the question and that was the same day that um you know Whoopi Goldberg was you know on her show the, the view and she said that the holocaust was not about the race was not about race and, and we had this really deep conversation and then um you know when I was sharing this with Aya you could really dive into this because it just really is a moment to show the re uh, and again the word I use the ridiculousness of creating this idea of, of race and and when you go through the curriculum you'll see this is one of the things the Germans struggled with and how do you decide and it just shows how difficult it was because this is a passive sentence like was Judaism considered a race and by whom so um and then 
also the idea of Judaism is religion, but then taking that to, to turn it into race. And it just really brings home this, this complexity of you know, turning things into race that don't exist and creating these laws and trying to find a way to define who really needs to follow these laws. And it, it just, it just shows the, you know, the, I, well, I, I don't have the right word, but it just, it really brought it home to students. And again, it, it just went with the, with the um, Whoopi Goldberg quote and interesting, the Guardian, that I shared an article from the Guardian and the gentleman who wrote the article, he, he quotes um, Whitman's book, um, Hitler's American Model in that and, and talking about how race is constructed and, but it was just a really good moment with the students. So, um, so we finish nine and, and we're talking about this idea of the construct of race and, and now, now we get into the Nazis look to American race laws. So this is when it gets um, interesting because it, it really gets into this um not comparison but this this book the hitler's american model but what the what it really does a great job with what this curriculum does a great job with, is it presents his arguments and it, it gives us the background on his on how you know he came up with this and and it really puts us in this difficult historical space so and it talks about you know how Whitman worked as an historian how he he looked at hundreds of primary and secondary documents and he looked at meeting notes and he looked at the laws and you know his arguments are complicated but what this curriculum does is they pull out two of um his assertions or two of his claims about race laws and citizenship and um, you know, Nazi lawyers and officials studied and they um, admired American race laws. And that's very clear through the evidence that he presents. Um, and they concluded that these laws treated black Americans and other minor minority groups as second-class citizens. So we go through all of that and they present um, also during this lesson, as you go through it, they present um, Whitman's arguments, but also some of the documents that he used to show this, and you know, one of them is a map. Uh, it's a it's a it's a U.S. map, it, written in German, and it's to show where the different racial laws are. And it's it's a very powerful um, piece of documentation. But we didn't want to share it with you because we thought it would <laughs> distract you too much. So when you get this curriculum, you have a chance. It's just an amazing um, primary document, and so these are you know these are the questions so at the end this is the key question that's raised by his book so after you go through all these so how can it be that america has both so much democracy and so much racism and again that brings in leon bass because he draws those parallels that he saw in nazi germany and also what he saw in jim crow america and um i feel very blessed because i don't know how many years ago but i was able to hear dr bass speak and um, his story, it is very powerful because he was in the segregated army. He was not, um, you know, he had been through a lot and there's a lot of anger in him. And then just being in Buchenwald, it really did change his, uh, his life and how he, he saw the world. And as you can see, he's such an amazing, even like hearing in his, his um, testimony, he's just a very powerful speaker. And he, you, he's really speaking to you when, when you hear him. And um, so that this lesson really sets this up. But again, it, it's, it anchors us back in the testimony of Dr. Bass because they've already heard at the very beginning, you know, the parallels he's drawn and then how he goes um, further into this. And it also, the methodology keeps going up about how to listen to, to testimony and, and putting it into the historical context, which we were also given a lot of information on, on that as well. So, and then, so then the last lesson I did with my students, which again is a powerful lesson because I listened to a lot of my friends and, and other coworkers who are dealing with a lot of teaching history that we shouldn't have to be dealing with as, as teachers. And um, so this is, this lesson is called Unjust Justice Systems. And what it also does is it's when you make this claim and then how are you gonna prove this claim? So you, you know, so Whitman is making the, you know, makes these assertions, makes these claims, um, you know, the, that I just talked about, about the race laws and citizenship and, um, and has evidence, 
so how do we how do we prove this? And there's no better way than again with primary documents. And so there's this really powerful lesson on looking at the Mississippi State Constitution. And I mean, it's it's right there, you know, Article 8, Section 207, separate schools shall be maintained for children of the white and colored races. And then they have, you know, the other one starts talking in about voting. And um, it's in the Constitution, and, and you have to be careful. And, and you know, Fortune Up also gives you a lot of disclaimers that because this was written in Mississippi. So some of the language is can is is very powerful and can be it's very offensive. And so, you know, but again, that's why you set up these safe spaces for the students to have these discussions. But then they also talk, there's also documents about um, voter disenfranchisement. And, you know, they have like a poll tax, you know, so and these are documents that you look at and how can you dispute them? They're, they're there in black and white. And so it's, this is evidence, this is proof. We're not making anything up. We're not trying to make anyone feel bad about themselves or whatever excuses people are making, but this is the history and this is how we're, presenting um, the history. And this is what the Nazis looked at. And um, again, this is Whitman's assertion claim. And, and you know, like Aya said, you're, you're dealing with hypotheses with the students. And, but again, it helps them to corroborate and begin to corroborate um, the information about the race laws in the Jim Crow South. And once again, the lesson follows that methodology of listening to testimony and putting it into historical context. But also a, a question that came up with my students when you were listening to um, Leon Bass's testimony, the event that he's talking about where he's not served coffee, because they also talk about that in the lesson, he's in Pennsylvania. I mean, he's in a considered Northern state. And, um, you know, so we, we did have some discussion around that, that the students were talking about, because we were saying the Southern, you know, Jim Crow South, but this was, he wasn't, he was a refused service in um, Pennsylvania. So, I mean, I think that's a really powerful thing to, to bring about too, talking about where this happened. Yes, the South, but also in, in the North. So um, these next slides are just some of the impact from the, from the students. And um, I just, you know, I highlighted one because my favorite, because you gotta love students and their honesty, but I love this. Although I thought the lessons were kind of boring, I learned a lot. So, but again, it's like students are that. So even if they see it as boring, they're still learning, but I just love their honesty. Eighth graders are so honest. But the second one, I really was impressed with, because again, you're hearing what can students learn? What can't they learn? And what are they able to take in? And, you know, talking about, I like how these lessons didn't try to sugarcoat everything because a lot of the time when people teach young people things, they try to hide all the bad things that humanity has done. But I think it's important to learn about the bad things because then we can see how much better we have improved, but we still know that we have a lot more to improve upon. So I just really thought, because sometimes um, we don't think our students can handle this, that they're too young, um, but they wanna know they don't wanna be lied to. And, but again, that's why I do things like the mood meter and the safe conversations because you know it, students are individuals also and some students can handle it better. But this idea that, you know, treat us as, you know, capable of learning this history. And, um, but they did really, and, uh, and again, you can see their focus because again, I was, I didn't do all the lessons. My focus was on this, the Jim Crow section of it, but they do talk about seeing that, um, just, you know, that unfairness and, and, you know, here he was fighting for his country and a restaurant, restaurant won't serve him. I mean, we kept going back to that early clip. They were so taken by that. It just really, um, really spoke to them at a, at a very um, high level. And they just, just thought it was amazing. And so I'll just end um, with my biggest takeaways. So if you look this, you know, this question, again, this is a screenshot from the thing. So what are multiple sources and perspectives or why are multiple sources and perspectives important in the study of the past? And what I found is that after we did this lesson, um, you know, we went on to the next lesson. So then I was looking at enslavement in New England. And so we were looking at, you know, how did, how did it start in the New England states? And again, working with primary documents, but I, there was such a huge difference 
in the way my students began to use the documents. And, you know, we're looking at the 1700s and late 1600s, early 1700s. So we don't have video testimony, but they really wanted to look at um, documents, primary documents. And, you know, so we would look for those and then, you know, specifically for New England. And then as they started reading these, then they wanted to know more. And they, so then they wanted more of the context. So we found books by different historians and we brought those in and, and they were trying, they were comparing what this historian said to that historian. And, you know, it wasn't just taking the information for granted. They were looking at, you know, why are they saying this? What evidence do they have? How can we corroborate this? Where else can we find it? And, you know, when they would look up an evidence, you know, then they found, because we went back to what we think was the first ship. Um, and then they went back through, they used slavevoyages.org and then they wanted to try to find out more about that. And then it traced them to Marble, Massachusetts where this ship was built. And then they found out that they wanted to put a picture of this ship on the wall of the library. So they wrote to the librarian to see if they could find out more about why would you wanna do this? Why is this the, the piece that you wanna put up? Um, and then it also harkened back to our, you know, they remembered back our Pequot war and, how it was Pequot who were traded for the enslaved in um, um, that were taken in, out of the West Indies. So they really um, took a unit that, or a, a lesson that, you know, normally we would just kind of go through, but they wanted to really dive into it and really dig into it and look at how this happened and, and find those primary documents and, and corroborate. So that for me was, an amazing change in how my students are looking at history, looking at um, how how we tell stories and how, um, you know, whose story are we telling and how are we telling this story. And it was just a very powerful moment for me as a teacher and, you know, that they're using what they learn, not just the information, but, but the strategies. So, um, that is, I'm going to stop sharing. And, um, and I can't believe I almost went in time. It was half an hour. So um, we have time for questions if there are any. I don't know if there are any. I think that was perfect timing. Thank you. And thank you, Aya, also for presenting. Um, I think we are a small enough group that if anyone has any questions, they can take themselves off mute. Um, and feel free to just ask the question. Yep. Jean, I think I saw your hand. Yep, there, yep. there I've got it. Um, <laughs> what is, you know, I, I did have a chance to look at the entire curriculum and I just wanted to let I know and um, let you, that it is a very powerful teaching tool, and I would love to use it if I ever got a chance to get back into the classroom. Um, one thing that came up in our discussion right now and something that has been on my mind as I view the world these days, and um, I happen to moderate a book club um, group about passing. Maybe some of you have read The Vanishing Half, and I got a chance to listen to an interview with the author, Britt Bennett. And what I would like to add if I was teaching today to mature students is this whole idea of construct, that race is a construct that human beings have created. Who, who decide, you know, that somebody somewhere decided that we have to look at difference instead of looking at similarity. And that that whole path of looking at difference for whatever reason has been the whole problem from day one. But you know, what you mentioned um, about the personal level of that once we, any time you bring groups of people into the same room on a personal level, there, without exception in my experience, it has been a positive experience. So this artificial um, construct called race, 
true we you know we see difference and it's very interesting because i live in a community where we have very few african americans and this one woman who chose to move into our community the day before Whoopi goldberg said her her statement she said the exact same thing to me gene when we walk into a room they see me for who i am and nobody says who you are yet and we've had many, many discussions and, but she's right. She's a dark skinned African-American, she's right. But what, that, that doesn't make us different. We have more in common than we have different. So I get off my soapbox, but um, I, I would add that if I was teaching about what makes this race, the definition of race, a construct. And what, what does that mean? It is, it actually is in, um, and I probably went through it too quickly, but that is a, a, a big part of, of lesson nine. I mean, it does, because it, it does, mm -hmm. they do see the, the artificiality of it. And that's part of what lesson nine, and again, as teachers, you know your students and, and where you want to, how much you want to go with it, but it, it absolutely comes up at that point about the, the idea of race as a construct and, um, and the, and the discussion and and what that could mean and um so that but again teachers you have the the ability to you know add to your students or you know add or whatever is comfortable at, at the time i could just add my one more thought to this just my own because it's been such a powerful experience to listen to these testimonies in their entirety right and then to try to select moments that may offer some kind of invitation and insight and John, you know, who, who literally had his bar mitzvah, right, in 1933, and he's very aware of, of the irony of it. And after all the suffering, he's still aware of, of those ironies and able to sort of take a step back. But he, from his experience, he talks about this mostly innocent childhood of identifying as a, as a German child, right, having his Jewish identity with no conflict alongside his German identity. And then the conflict begins when these laws begin to create the construct of race in his context. And I, one of the things that I find so powerful about James Whitman's analysis of the Nuremberg laws, he just takes the, the race citizenship law, right? And looks at the categories used to construct the idea of race to apply it then to, to the Jewish people um, and looks at the categories, right? So there's family descent, there is life choices by marriage, right? If you remember in the Nuremberg laws, the clause, if you're married to a Jew, then there is um, practice, religious practice or lack thereof. All of these completely disparate categories get melded into this idea of race, right? So that, that to me is one of those very powerful moments where the constructedness of race, the othering of people by this idea is, is on full display. So that's just a second, everything that you said really. Well, my father was bar mitzvahed in Vienna in 1933 as well. And yet, on March 12, 1938, when he walked out into the street, that's when all of a sudden it wasn't okay. He said, I don't know how they knew. They weren't wearing stars yet. He says, but all of the, we couldn't even walk a block down the street. So that's how artificial it is. I think, Alan, you had your hand in them too. Yeah, thank, thanks, Beth. Um, and Jeannie, thank you for bringing up the topic because it's a really important one that is reinforced by Professor Yehuda Bauer and, and how we approach the topic. And, and the, you know, and I approach it with my kids who were currently, currently uh, middle school age. And I approach it through lessons in terms of identity, which brings me to the next question is depending on the level of maturity of the group, how is this developmentally conducive for six or possibly six, but for, I'm mostly interested in seventh graders. So if I can reframe that as a question, is how do you feel about approaching these lessons with seventh graders? Go for it. So I think maybe Colleen, you would be best positioned to speak about it from our perspective in terms of designing it. We really thought that we wouldn't invite teachers 
below sixth grade to engage with this curriculum. And then at the sixth and seventh grade level to really leave it up to the teacher to decide those individual students. In terms of cognitively that, that moment where they, they enter seventh and eighth grade, there is that readiness to grapple with complexity. But in terms of where they are emotionally and especially in the context of the pandemic and what that has done to, to students' emotions, we really, that piece we defer to teachers to, to look through it and then to augment it and to change it in any way that they feel, you know, literally just taking a single source that maybe from that lesson that speaks to their group of students and leaving everything else aside um, or, or modifying in their ways. But Colleen, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, that's, that's exactly what I would say, because like I said, I teach eighth grade, but I also, I know these students, I've had them for three years. I, I know, I know them as people, I know them as students. So I, I was very comfortable. Um, and again, it's a smaller class. It's, um, you know, I, I know where they stand. So with the larger class, it's really, I agree with, with I, and, and the, the way this is developed is, you don't have to do exactly you could use it as a source and if there's a, like a testimony you want to take out or if there's a primary document you want to take out and use it with the students but it's um and you know and i go back to what my one student said you know they don't want everything sugar-coated but if that's where you you have to know your audience and you can really take pieces of this and use it with your students and you can modify things, you can change things, you can make the, um, the if you're taking a primary document, you can make the, the language a little bit easier. Um, there's nothing, uh, the Mississippi constitution, that's a trick is to me personally, I think you need a lot of context with that because it, there's a lot of really offensive language in there and that, and depending on the maturity level of your students. so. Um, yeah, Bernard, but I really agree with what Aya said. It's possible, but you have to know your students and really choose carefully what you what you use. But I wouldn't use this again. My sixth grade now, I wouldn't use it with them. They don't have the maturity. Um, seventh grade, I'd be if he, my eighth graders, I just felt were a good age for this. But it, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. Thank you. Stu, if you want to pop on. Uh, sure. Uh, first off, uh, Aya, thank you. And Colleen, thanks so much. Aya, you are the driving force behind this project. And uh, it is an absolutely uh, um, invaluable uh, document that we as teachers now have. Colleen, the thoughtful and insightful responses of your students is um, doesn't happen by accident. It's a reflection of the quality of the teacher that they have. So uh, kudos to both of you on that. The question I have um, is, and it, it may be a little off, off topic, uh, but uh, I mean, the, the, this construct of race, we know that Hitler incorporates this as sort of this removal of the escape clause for, for Jews in, in Europe at this time. Now, they, they, you know, they, they couldn't leave, they couldn't convert, and now, as a race, they can't change. But uh, I'm if if we jump ahead into the future now with this material, how do we begin to or or have you considered the relationship between this material and Holocaust denial? Uh, in other words, uh, we know that um, it has been said many times, but uh, time is on the side of the deniers. Uh, and how are we going to? Uh, uh, continue to make these historical, factual, uh, uh, evidentiary reports to students so that the event is not forgotten. We don't give any posthumous victories to, to uh, the Nazis by, by forgetting the crime. So can, we, can you speak to, uh, or if you have we thought about the relationship between this material and into the future relative to uh, battling Holocaust denial. Um, so that's that's a hugely important topic. I think you know that the question of creating a space of factual inquiry that also includes very subjective testimonies, right, and honoring those testimonies, not 
in that space while advocating and creating the possibility of strong teaching of the Holocaust in a way that excludes the possibility of denial, right? Like that's that's the goal really that's driving behind many Holocaust curriculum projects, this one, this one included, that's that's essential. I think what we grapple with um, dealing with testimony, right, is that uniqueness of that source because Testimonies have both elements of fact of experiences that, you know, specific events, for example, that happen that can be corroborated. That's, and then there is the question of memory and the delicacy of how memory changes in traumatic circumstances and this, as, as time passes. And then there's subjective elements. And I think the challenge specifically for us in bringing testimonies to that space of teaching about the Holocaust is to strike a balance between uh, showing the ways in which these testimonies in dialogue with each other, in dialogue with primary sources are an extremely strong and important primary source that makes it impossible to deny the Holocaust. And at the same time, making space for those moments of memory and of inaccuracies, which work within the realm of testimony and for which there is room within you know, thinking of it as that specific type of source that requires that specific type of reflection. So it's a it's a work in progress for us in terms of figuring out that balance. You know, there's lots of scholarship, of course, on, on all of this, but uh, but the question of, of to create educational materials that will allow students right to to have a historically minded skill set, you know, historic disciplinary historical thinking that helps them to then look at these claims of denial and question them and push against them with evidence that's a big driving force, I think, in the curriculum. And if I could just add, it's not Holocaust, yeah. but during the testimony, my students did pick up on, because there is all this context, and they did pick up on, because Leon Bass talks about, you know, I spent three years in the military, and, and then when they were looking at the records, they said, oh, he wasn't in there for three years, and they were, so they were making that connection, but so we did have a big conversation with, does that does that mean that what he's saying that isn't true or and we did talk about that memory piece and that was in a much less dangerous than denial but the students will pick up on things but it is also good for them to have those tools to look at testimony and and the purpose of testimony and, and why testimony is important and you know like i was saying about memory but because they will pick up things and it's um because they pay attention which is good Thank you. I think, David, we have just enough time for your question. I'm always the last one. It's good. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, oh, great. I, I mean, I, I thank you for this uh, really uh, interesting, uh, two interesting presentations. I make this connection a lot in my in my class, but I, I don't know how, you know, knowledgeable uh, I am in a comprehensive sense about it, but um, uh, but I do work a lot on the, this idea of the construction, construction of race in my Holocaust and genocide studies class at, at Southern. Uh, but I had two quick questions, and maybe, you know, if there's not enough time, you could always uh, you contact me later. But one was that there was a couple of things said about getting the students to think historically, to do historical inquiry, uh, think of themselves as historians. And then I think I said, near the end, historical disciplinary thinking. So I had kind of a philosophical question about what it means to think historically, you know, for, for you in some uh, general sense. That's my, my, my first question. I was reminded of something from uh, uh, Heidegger. He, he talked about being historical thinking, sein gestischer denken. And, and that was always a puzzle to me. So this idea of thinking historically, uh, if, is one thing, what does it mean philosophically? And the second question was, um, also you, you might need to contact me later, but if, so you're making this connection between, which I do also in my class, between Jim Crow laws and Nuremberg race laws, but uh, do you go back to, uh, to uh, Rwanda, for example, for the implementation, the construction of race, according to race science, I mean, in, in, in this curriculum or in, in your own thinking? Uh, where where these two, you know arbitrary distinctions are set up between the Tutsi and the Hutu that then have historical implications later, uh, and 
and and one of those implications is in the uh, Armenian genocide, where where there's a a, 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 a racist uh, objectification of Armenians as uh, tubercular microbes, uh, and and then the last and then to, just to finish that thought, the uh, a, a lot of people say that that the, the Nazis learned from the Ottoman Empire. They learned about race science, right, from the Ottoman Empire because the Germans were allies with, with the Ottoman Empire and were on the scene, right, during that genocide. So uh, that was, I, I didn't see any evidence of that in the course. Maybe it's too complicated because the focus is on the United States and I can see strategic reasons for that. But it was, yeah, a really, really, really great, great work you're doing, everyone. Thank you for those questions. I, the questions are fascinating. I would love to connect to talk more about historical thinking from all the different angles, right? There's epistemology involved. There's the different schools of thought. Um, I, Michel de Certeau has fascinating writings, which I'm sure you've looked at. I, I just would love to come back to that conversation. But uh, for the purposes of the curriculum, I am using a framework from history education literature in the United States specifically. Uh, developed by Sam Weinberg back in the early 90s, uh, which operationalized, you know, for the purposes of the classroom to think about historians thinking in terms of how historians read texts in terms of certain heuristics, and those would be sourcing texts, um, then contextualizing information, corroborating texts, just in a, in a very kind of contained way for the classroom. What I'm working on in terms of research, in addition to that, is also looking at historiography and that type of thinking as distinct from the analysis of primary sources. And we're bringing some elements of that as well into the curriculum. Uh, but with all of that, you know, our focus then thematically in this particular set has really been just the German and the United States context with full awareness that there is lots of other comparisons to make and we're hoping to in the future expand units like this to compare to other genocides in different ways and the constructs of race in different contexts but for the for the moment it's it's very contained to, to try to work out exactly you know the the thinking heuristics about how to invite students to do to convey to them some elements of that disciplinary thinking in a way that they can grapple with in the, you know at their stage in the learning um, and then content will come come with time. All right. Yeah, you used another one of my favorite terms. Yeah, historiographic. That's another. <laughs> that's another good one. That's isn't that a is it is it a historiographic question to ask students to think about when, how we say when the Holocaust began. Is that a historiographic question? I think it can be both, right? Yeah. Where, how, how, where do you put the starting point? Uh, mm -hmm. It could be 300 years back. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you to our presenters. And thank you for attending. Um, a couple of things before we wrap up. I will be sending out a recording of this workshop probably within the next couple of days. Um, we also receive a survey. And what we want to hear from you is if there's a particular topic you want to hear about, um, do you want to present a topic? So you'll get that survey with the video. Um, and then otherwise, I hope you have the beautiful weather that I'm having and get to go enjoy it and be on the lookout for our March workshop as well. Thank you.